Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, Hi. Glad, glad you could tune in tonight. Uh, my name is Terry Lynch. Uh, this is the September meeting of the Nonprofit Plant Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin. Uh, the mission of our group um, is to inspire, educate, and support each other on an evidence backed plant based nutritional path for health and improved quality of life. It's a mouthful. Our group is open to everyone, those plant-based and those just curious about it. And it's meant to be, meant to be a non-judgmental place uh, for people to come get information and support and make their own decisions in regard to what direction they wish to pursue. Um, if you'd like more information about our group, our upcoming meeting dates, speakers, cooking classes, and other resources, uh, you can go to our website, which is pbnow, or pbnow.org. Uh, as we do each time at the beginning of the meeting, can I see a show of hands, either by, if you have your vi video on by your hand, or if you have the video off using the thumbs up reaction icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen, to show how many of you are currently plant-based or following a plant-based uh, lifestyle. Oh, that's great. That's about, it looks like about half of the group so far. I'm on the phone. If you can yes. hear me, this is Kathleen. Yeah, I'm not on Zoom or anything. Uh, that's fine, Kathleen. So Okay, you, so mostly plant-based. Mostly, excellent. Mostly, yeah. Um, as we mentioned at each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition for people of all ages as published in non-biased medical research is quite striking. Uh, whether it's improving health through increased energy, weight loss, preventing slowing, stopping, or reversing problems like allergies, digestive problems, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, other heart disease, and dementia, or increasing the quality of life with a stronger immune system, more endurance, better athletic performance, faster recovery from exercise, less painful joints or clearer thinking, as well as reducing the physical, emotional, and financial side effects of the drugs and procedures often recommended to treat the problems plant-based nutrition can help us avoid. The research shows that our bodies do a wonderful job of healing themselves if we just stop damaging them with poor nutrition and start giving them what they were designed to run on. It is really it, truly remarkable. The benefits are particularly relevant now during the pandemic as uh, three of the top pre-existing health conditions that increase the chances of someone who gets cold having a serious reaction are obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. These conditions, all of these conditions have been shown in medical research and clinical practice to be slowed, stopped, or reversed by plant-based nutrition. So once again, it's quite amazing what your body can do by itself to heal itself if you give it what it needs. Now, let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. Uh, you'll hear from three speakers tonight. Uh, first, we're going to hear from our PBNOW or PBNOW medical director, cardiologist, uh, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Uh, next, we'll hear from a plant-based cooking instructor, Amberly Childs, who will lead a 10 to 15 minute group discussion and, and uh, update us on any upcoming plant-based cooking classes. And then at 6.30, we'll connect with our featured speaker, Dr. Columbus Batiste, who will talk to us from California and give us a presentation followed by uh, hopefully 20 minutes of Q&A. Our program should end by 7.30. Um, as a reminder, we have uh, meetings every month on the second, usually the second Thursday of the month at six o'clock. Next month, October 8th, we're going to have Dr. Michael Clapper, who's spoken to us before. He's a pioneer in using plant-based nutrition to improve health. Uh, and a quick technical note, uh, during the meeting, uh, we ask that everybody but the speakers be muted, and that's to avoid uh, background noise and to allow everybody who's listening to, to be able to hear the speaker uh, as clearly as possible. Uh, if you have questions or during our Q&A and during our discussion, you can use the chat function, which you should find right down in the, uh, depending on your device, it's usually down about the middle of the bottom of your screen. 
Uh, there's a little icon that looks like uh, something you'd see in a cartoon uh, with the word chat underneath it. If you click that, uh, you might want to click it just to check it out now if you're not familiar with it, but a bo white box will show up in the middle of the screen uh, and you can type uh, a mes message in there and then hit enter and it will show up for the um, speaker to be able to uh, address that uh, message. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, our first speaker tonight is a fellowship trained cardiologist practicing cardiology at Ascension Columbia St. Mary's here in Milwaukee. He is past president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology. And he's also a member of the 50 person National American College of Cardiology prevention subgroup. Some of the other members on that group include physicians like Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and Dr. Neil Barnard. Our speaker is an advocate for the use of plant-based nutrition to help improve heart health, general health, and quality of life, and has seen the benefits of plant-based nutrition in both his personal life and that of his patients. We are fortunate to have him here practicing in Milwaukee and with us tonight. I'm happy to welcome our first speaker tonight, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Dr. Liberman. Thanks, Harry. Appreciate it. Always appreciate the introduction and uh, your. Uh, oh, <laughs> Siri thinks that I'm talking. No, and one other thing I'd mention, Josh, too, for everybody who's on uh, on here, if you don't, if you are in, uh, you you probably want to go to speaker view. That's in the upper up right hand corner. You can click that, and then Dr. Liberman or whoever happens to be speaking will take up most of your screen. Uh, otherwise, you're going to see a lot of people here and you're going to have to yeah, but That could be good or bad to have my ugly mug staring at you in a full screen. So maybe you might want to keep it small. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. And, uh, you know, I am, uh, you know, ha as always, you know, for those who are return uh, uh, participants, you know, you know that I'm always happy to be uh, part of this. Um, the network of, of plant-based physicians uh, nationwide, but more specifically locally in the Metro Milwaukee area is always increasing. Uh, you know, Terry and I were able to make some connections to some people in the Aurora system just a couple weeks ago, which was really nice. And, you know, just it's just nice to see um, not just all of you on this call, but also healthcare professionals learning about this, uh, you know, learning about the benefits of a plant-based uh, diet and, uh, and, and because ultimately they're gonna to talk to their patients about it. Um, you know, just a, as a side note, um, I was the, the, the president of the, the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology for the, the past three years. My, my term ended in March, but I'm still obviously heavily involved. And we have our annual meeting um, uh, this weekend actually. So we usually, it's, you know, in medical conferences, it's usually a bunch of doctors in a large conference room, speakers, you know, you know one at a time standing up in front and, giving a talk about their expertise for 45 minutes was time for questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. Obviously in the time of COVID, uh, that can't happen now. Um, so it's all virtual, which has been nice because it's allowed us to actually reach out to more uh, nationally renowned speakers who can record, uh, you know, 45 minute lectures and, and, uh, and we, you know, kind of uh, stitch them together over the course of the day. So that's this weekend as we have our annual meeting. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because we have a couple talks on prevention in that meeting and, and I'm actually giving a talk on, you know, the benefits of plant-based diet in that meeting. And again, the, the, hope, the, the hope is, is that, you know, again, the more lives you can touch with this, the more people you can talk to, um, you know, somebody will learn about it, somebody will experience it for themselves. And when they see the benefits themselves, they're going to talk to their patients about it. So it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing process and, and that, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's great that you all are here as part of it. Um, again, for those who are new, uh, you know, I'm a preventive cardiologist, but I like to, you know, for, with my small portion of these meetings, I like to talk about my experience with my patients, as well as just, you know, maybe a, an update on some literature that's out there. So in terms of my experience with my patients, I don't have anything from this week because I'm on the inpatient service this week. And actually I've been for the last two, two for two of the last three weeks, I've been on the inpatient service just by a quirk of scheduling. Um, and, you know, in, in patients are you know, it's a difficult group of patients uh, to try to, you know, preach to about plant-based diets. Number one, because they're, they're usually often ill, they're sick, they're scared. Uh, they don't necessarily, they're not in the right mindset to, to think about completely changing their lives or being told that a lot of what they've done up until now is the reason that they're in the hospital, which is, you know, the reality. Uh, but also because 
Unfortunately, our, our, our hospital doesn't really support plant-based diets, so it, it's a little bit difficult to talk to somebody about how they should really cut down their red meat when our hospital is serving them a hamburger right after their, their bypass surgery. <laughs> and that's not a criticism of just my hospital. It's just, you know, all hospitals are, are doing the same thing. It's just a real shame, and, and we're working on it, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a slow pro you know, it's a slow it's a slow process, but um, I, you know, I did uh, about a, a week and a half ago see a patient um, that's just top of my mind. Uh, you know, early sixties, um, uh, the typical uh, Metro Milwaukee male. So you know, more of a uh, uh, an apple-shaped body than than a, than a pencil-shaped body. Um, uh, you know, uh, loved his you know uh, kind of a you know Packers beer, brats and cheese kind of guy, a business owner in the area, and. Um, you know, got referred to me by his primary for some cholesterol problems. And I took it an opportunity uh, many months ago to talk to him about risk factors. And he ended up getting uh, one of those heart scan tests I talked about in the past and showed that he actually had a fair amount of heart disease already, even though he wasn't symptomatic. So that obviously opened his mind a little bit more about what he could do about, you know, reducing the burden of that and reducing his risk of having bad things. So we, of course, talked about a plant-based diet and he came back to see me. Um, he's actually come back to see me twice. So this is the second time. Um, and he just made, after the first visit, he made substantial progress and he continues to maintain that progress. But he, you know, he's lost about 15 to 20 pounds. Um, and more importantly than that, uh, you know, he's, is, he went from being at the, um, the upper range of borderline diabetes, so almost into diabetes now to back towards the lower range of, 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 uh, of that, that borderline range and, and the upper range of, and the upper limit of normal. So he's revert, you know, he's improved his, what we call his insulin resistance. He's become more insulin sensitive. Um, his triglycerides cut in basically half from, you know, 280 something down to 140. So, and, and he hasn't even become fully plant-based, right? So he's just tried to make changes. You know, it's hard to change when you have 60 years of behavior built into you, in, unless you're highly motivated to do something. Um, but he's made changes. He's given up uh, meat. He still eats some fish um, and he's cut back on, on uh, you know, a lot of processed foods. And, and just with those small changes, really, uh, he's had tremendous progress. And, and of course, it's, it's heartening to him, pardon the pun, uh, and, it, and, it, and it helps him, you know, it, it reinforces the benefits of it to him and, and maybe to you all as well. Uh, that's just, you know, I see this routinely in my office. Uh, you, you folks on this call may have experienced it depending on, you know, how, um, how, you know, how uh, close to the, you know, a plant-based diet you're adhering to. Uh, and maybe you have some family members that are doing it too. Um, but that's what, that's what we see in the medical world if people do this. Um, in terms of research, you know, I, I actually, you know, as I said, I, I've been pretty busy on the inpatient work, so I haven't had a chance to catch up on, on a bunch of articles, but I did want to highlight maybe a little historical um, um, uh, perspective. And this actually comes to mind because I'm going to be talking about it tomorrow during this conference. And, and I really, you know, just want to give a little summary on that, um, which is that, you know, a lot of um, a lot of the heart benefits were first seen uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, and they were really prompted by research by, you know, Dean Ornish, Dr. Dean Ornish, who is really kind of the, the godfather, so to speak, of, of preventive cardiology. And he did a study called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, and I don't know if anybody on this call is familiar with it. it um, but, you know, when you're, when you're you know, when a little bit more well-read in this field, uh, you know, that, that's a commonly talked about uh, trial. But it was a small trial, only 60, about 60 people in it. It was published in 1990 in The Lancet, which is, you know, one of the premier medical journals uh, uh, yeah, out of uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, basically, he had everybody eating. It wasn't even actually an exclusively plant-based diet. They were allowed to have um, a, a small portion of dairy, mostly in the form of yogurt. They were allowed to have egg whites. Um, but, regard, but other than that, it was a vegetarian diet. Um, uh, they, you know, they were counseled on quitting smoking. They had uh, kind of group therapy, kind of like this, having a community of people that were going through the same thing together. And they fought, and, and he followed these people for a year. So he basically completely controlled their lifestyles for, for half the group, 28 people, versus the other half were just left to, you know, usual care. And no cholesterol-lowering drugs were used or anything like that. And, you know, there, there's lots of benefits and lots of everything. They, they actually did angiograms on all these patients and so, showed that for the patients who were on the, the more or less plant-based diet had regression or melting away of plaque versus the other group that had progression of, of plaque in their hearts. These are all patients, I should have said, that had heart disease to begin with and were having symptoms to begin with. Um, so right there, you know, 82% of the patients who were in the experimental group, which was the lifestyle change group, um, had an average change towards melting away of plaque. 
And this was just one year in patients who had such severe blockages that they were having symptoms. Um, but, but more importantly, I wanna highlight this. 91% of the patients in the experimental group had um, a reduction in the frequency of chest pain attacks. 91% had a reduction in the frequency of chest pain attacks. 42%, almost half, had a reduction in the length of their chest pain attacks. Um, and a third had a reduction in the severity of their attacks. So they were having few, they were lasting for shorter amounts of times, uh, and they were, and, uh, and they were uh, much less frequent as well. Oh, and, and much less severe. Um, in contrast, the patients in the usual group had a 165% increase in the frequency of attacks, right? So they had almost a doubling of, or actually almost a tripling of, of, of attacks. They had a 95% increase in duration of chest pain attacks, and they had a 39% increase in the severity of the attacks. So, you know, completely, you can't even see in my hands, uh, but, but complete opposite directions uh, of severity and uh, of this really debilitating chest pain. And what does that mean? It simply means uh, that, that this was working to reduce uh, angina. It was working to reduce the severity of their blockages. And when he looked at the patients who were most adherent to the lifestyle diet versus least adherent, the patients who are most adherent to the diet and lifestyle had the most benefit in terms of regression of plaque. So these were the things that were seen. He followed them up five years later and, and, and published that in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, and uh, showed even more regression of, of, of blockages. And so this is what I see with my patients on you know, a week to week basis. And so it's not just me saying it, it's not just Terry saying it, um, it's not just you know, people proselytizing or talking about this or that. There is hard data published as, as, as Terry said in non-biased peer reviewed medical journals showing the benefit of plant-based diets certainly on cardiac uh, concerns, which is you know, my specialty, but also in lots of other things as well. So uh, I hope that you all stay well, stay mentally well uh, in, these, uh, in these really crazy times uh, and these scary times, but um, reach out to friends, reach out to family, uh, make sure you have love in your life, make sure you have connection in your life, uh, eat healthy and take care of yourselves. Josh, thank you so much for that excellent information. That's just astounding. I mean, in that uh, heart uh, and Dr. Warnish's uh, uh, trial is, as uh, Dr. Liberman mentioned, uh, a very, very well-known trial out there. Uh, and uh, the, the, result, the results were astounding at that time. They're still astounding now. Yeah, I mean, you know, Almost 80% of, of patients in the lifestyle uh, arm uh, were able to reduce their medication burden versus none of the patients in the usual care arm at that time. So, I mean, just think about that. I mean, that's, that's really what we're talking about, healing yourself, getting off of medication if you, you know, with, with, with these changes. And these are, these are some of the, these were some of the sickest heart patients. So, I mean, it's really powerful. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker will be leading a group discussion for about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, before I introduce her, let me cover, cover a technical note again. During the discussion, please use the Zoom chat function you should find near the bottom of your screen. It says chat. If you click on that now, it should open up that chat box, a white box in the middle of your screen within which you can type your question or comment. You can drag that over to the side so you can actually see our speaker as well. Um, now let me introduce our speaker. Uh, she's a plant-based cooking instructor, trained and certified in the, uh, in the Food for Life program that's run by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine out in Washington, D.C., headed by Dr. Uh, Neil Barnard. Uh, one of the wonderful things they do out there is that they train and certify instructors to teach people how to incorporate plant-based nutrition into their daily lives. There are a number of Food for Life certified instructors in the country, but uh, many areas of the country don't have the luxury of having one nearby. We not only have one in Milwaukee, but she's excellent. To lead our group discussion and update us on upcoming plant-based cooking classes, here's plant-based cooking instructor, Amberly Childs. Amberly? Amberly, are you there? I'm un unmuting myself now. How about that? 
Okay, I see smiles. There you go. All right. Well, anyways, nice to see everybody again. Hello. Um, so today we are going to be, I'm going to be leading us in a group discussion. And so Terry and I have kind of been brainstorming about things that people might want to talk about. Um, and so today our topic is going to be breakfast. We are going to talk about plant-based breakfast. So if you would like to play along and you would like to share, we would love to hear your input. Um, and so I would encourage you to use your chat box. Um, so before we do that, I'm going to share my screen so you can stop looking at me. Okay, can you guys see a blue screen plant-based breakfast? Yeah. All right, perfect. So plant-based breakfast, I love this quote. I got it from the internet. Kathy Freston is um, a wonderful vegan advocate, um, but I love this. It says breakfast is the most important meal of the day. When you feed yourself what your body needs, when it needs it, that's love. So give your bod some TLC and sit down and enjoy a good substantial breakfast. And I think we're all so quick to move through our day and to get our day going and to just jump into that to-do list that's been racking up that we forget that there's something really important that needs to take place in the beginning of our day, and that is food. So what are the benefits of eating breakfast? It increases our metabolism, which is gonna help you throughout the day. It helps maintain or lose weight. It can enhance our mood. Um, just like exercise can. When we eat better, we feel better. Um, it can stimulate intelligence. So it's really, really an essential for children because if they're not eating well, it's not, their minds are going to be not developing as well. Um, and it enhances our immune system. All right, so now we're going to move into our group discussion. So what I want to know is what do you eat for breakfast? So with that, I want you to go down to the bottom of your screen, hover over the chat function, um, and type in the box what you eat, um, and we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so I'll start. Um, in my house, um, a big favorite is we use um, a multigrain toast. Um, I eat a gluten-free multigrain toast, and that just tends to be a little bit better for my body and my joints. And then... Um, my husband um, does almond butter with banana berries, either blueberries, raspberries of some kind, and he kind of makes like a fruit sandwich. Um, I, on the other hand, am not really a sweet person. I'm more of a savory person. So for me, um, I will do a hummus spread over my multigrain gluten-free toast, and I love the everything spice, everything bagel spice from Trader Joe's. So I put a little on that. So for me, I like to get those beans in there through the hummus that really kind of help my belly feel full along with a nice um, multi-grain. Um, so that is what we eat in my family. And I wanted to see, did, did anybody? Terry, do you see anything? I mean, as far as- uh, In oh, the chat yeah, box. They're, they're, all, they're all privately. So um, I'm not quite sure why they're privately, uh, okay. but wait, for anybody who's doing, using the chat box, oh, there is a, um, okay, down I'm at the bottom where you type it in, there's a little blue, usually a blue thing with an arrow next to it. It either says everyone or it says privately. And everything is coming through here so far, I see is privately, so. Oh, uh, it's going to you? So Grace, um, said uh, oatmeal berries, nuts, coconut flakes, cinnamon, chia seeds. Ooh, chia um, seeds. I like that one. The next one is, uh, and we've got about five or six of them here, oatmeal with blueberries and flax seeds, sometimes thrown northern or black beans. Okay. Beans, and in, in, that's interesting. Beans in oatmeal. Um, super protein, right? You're getting lots of good oats in that protein, but then you're going to throw some beans in there. I love a good bean any time of the day. Uh, next is... Uh, oh, good. I see them coming in, y'all. You do? Okay. Cereal, juice, sometimes toast with peanut butter. Okay. Uh, next is uh, 
sourdough toast topped with sweet and tangy mustard and hummus. Wow. Ooh. And avocado, red onion, and sprouts. See, there's somebody that's got my savory going on. I love some avocado toast as well, right? Yeah, I haven't tried that. I've got, that's something I have an interest in trying. Yeah, I've got a couple here as well, Terry, that have come into me. Um, Valerie uh, does Special K with a oatmeal granola. She uses a soy milk, uh, berries, avocado. I think you might have. Um, multigrain toast with tomato and cooked kale. There you go. I really like that because you're bringing in lunch foods, dinner foods, like breakfast doesn't have to be just sweet. It doesn't have to be traditional. I think you should eat for what your palate wants, what you're craving. That doesn't mean you can eat donuts, <laughs> um, but eat what you're craving and eat what makes you feel full. And if you feel full, you're going to feel more like organically, you will feel more confidently to move through your day because your body is going to like be getting that big food hug that you get. Um, all right, let's see. I got a couple other ones. Yeah, I've got uh, a bunch still in private. Yeah, nectarines, fruit. Um, I know I've done detoxes in the past and they'll, they'll recommend eating all fruit for breakfast um, until lunch and then bringing in a big giant, as much as you can eat green salad and as many raw veggies. And the idea is that the fruit really kind of one, it kickstarts the system um, and you're getting high antioxidants that are coming in. Um, so on as much fruit as, as, as you can handle um, and seasonally, I think is really awesome to eat. Um, but yeah, good old nectarine um, for me, anytime, Tracy. Ooh, Eileen has commented and I'm just into this that she makes veggie omelets using just eggs. So any of you um, use just egg out there? Um, it is a newer vegan product that's out and um, it literally is, I wish I had it with me, it's a yellow, it almost looks like a yellow um, Dijon mustard container, but it says just eggs on it. And it's kind of like, it's liquid and so you would use it to make an omelet um, I prefer the Just Egg product. They also have a Just Mayo, um, which is a vegan mayo as well. Um, so it's really been a lifesaver if you like omelets because of the consistency is really good. Um, I think that and I think other people as well. All right, so we got some smoothies coming in. You know, the smoothie's not dead, everybody. And the smoothie's getting a bad rap every now and again because it feels a little played out. But here's what I wanna say about smoothies eat the fridge smoothie. When you're like, oh, I'm hungry, or oh, I don't know what to do. I know it's a little bit more challenging as, as we move into winter, you know, way, way, way down the road. But look in your fridge, what, what is about to go? Can you throw a little greens in there? Can you throw some fruit in there? Can you throw something frozen in there? And just kind of blend it up, um, get it sweet enough to where you like it. Throw in your flax seed. A lot of you all have commented about using flax, using chia seed. And these are wonderful, healthy fats. And it's a great way to get them in, in addition to an oatmeal or a, smooth, um, or a bowl of some kind. All right, so Gregory is, is stepping his game up here. He's making a tofu garden veggie scramble three days a week. So Gregory, we need to know your address and when you're serving backyard social distance brunch. Because <laughs> it sounds delicious. You know, but so here's what I like about what Gregory's doing. He's treating himself during breakfast. He's taking time to say, I'm gonna make food now and, and maybe you have extra that you could snack on a little bit later. Could you double your pancake recipe so you can then use them the next day? I love to take pancakes and put them in my air fryer and reheat them in like two minutes and they get a little crunchy on the outside. Really nice. Gregory, we're coming over. Um, Amberly? Oh, Yep, we're on time. Yeah, we're, we're out of time. Okay, well, you guys have all given us some really great suggestions here. These have been wonderful. I wish we were all in person because we'd have a little bit more time to talk about it. Um, I'm going to get two more minutes and then I will step away. Um, one, Janet commented on coconut yogurt. 
And I just wanna say, I was in um, Whole Foods the other day, Aldi the other day, um, and Trader Joe's, and the amount of non-dairy yogurt on the shelves these days is amazing. They now have Oatly. There's an oat yogurt you can get. You can get coconut, almond, soy. I mean, so many different types of non-dairy yogurt. So go out there and look for those because those can be a great breakfast and or snack. All right, so here's the last thing I'm gonna leave you all with is this is a recipe that um, we are going to be sharing. Terry's going to share with everybody this fruited quinoa breakfast. That is so good. I've made it in a cooking class before. You might have joined. So you're going to get that follow up the meeting um, unless you're super fast and you can take a screenshot right now. Great. Yeah, well, the last ready. thing I'm saying is um, if you haven't checked out Plant Joy, my new soup delivery, um, I wanted to let everybody know that now I am delivering soup throughout the greater Milwaukee area. Um, it is all included in the price. Um, if you visit my website, plantjoy.net, um, we, this week's soup are an Indian sweet potato and black bean stew. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a creamy tomato bisque that is frozen. And you'll see below here on the slide, these are all the areas that delivery is, is included. And if you live outside of those areas, we can certainly make it happen. So the last, the upcoming classes that we have scheduled, I promise we're gonna get you guys in the loop. We'll share this. Um, I'm gonna share this presentation with Terry. So you'll get a copy of it as well. But in October, we're going to have a class about breast cancer fighting foods, talking about how do we preventatively look at breast cancer. Um, and as a 10 year survivor, I can tell you, food is the top of that list. So um, thank you all. I'm sorry I ran over my time. Um, eat breakfast, and I look forward to seeing you all next month. Um, just before you leave, Amberly, if you want to put uh, each one of those slides up uh, for people to take a screenshot of, it may be midweek before uh, I sent out the recipe if you had an interest in that. But this Okay, here's the recipe. If you guys want to screenshot or grab your phone, um, <clears throat> It is super good. All right, and then the second part of it, oh, sorry, somebody's phone coming up. All right, here you go. Five, four, three, <laughs> two, it's changing. Keep your phones. Here's the directions. This is what you want to do with all that food. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. All right, there's my website. I will stop sharing my screen. And Terry, I will give it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Amberly, for that. Uh, You're very welcome. Reading that. Thank you everybody for uh, Yeah, participating. thank you for participating. I hope and, you guys were taking notes. And this, uh, Amberly, and I, I would like to have this a regular part of every meeting where, we, where we're talking about something like this that uh, people have an interest in so we can have some back and forth and we can learn from each other. Uh, with that, we are going to go to our uh, featured speaker tonight. Uh, he is Chief of Cardiology at Kaiser Permanente Riverside in Marino and Marino Valley Medical Centers in sunny California. He has been featured in the documentaries The Game Changers, which uh, if you haven't seen, or if you've seen it already, I've watched it probably three times now, and it is just so super inspiring and informative and uh, Eating You Alive, which is another great documentary. He's known as the Healthy Heart Doc, and he sits on the American College of Cardiology's 50-member National Prevention subgroup with doctors Dean Ornish, who Dr. Uh, Liverman was talking about the, stu the uh, study that Dr. Ornish came out that was just groundbreaking, uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, who uh, many of you probably recognize the name of, Neil Bernard, and our own Dr. Joshua Liberman sits on that uh, subgroup. Speaking to us tonight from California, we're excited to welcome Dr. Columbus Batiste. Dr. Batiste. Good evening, how are you? Great to see you. Likewise, likewise. Good. 
I'll tell you, you know, it's a little unfair to follow that that uh, little intro where you all were talking about food and after coming off a day of work and now I'm hungry with the, the different scrambles and the bowls. I mean, it's a little unfair. So now my stomach is growling, but thank you very much. I'm a, I'll, I'll, I'll work. I'll make it past all of this. But well, this is great stuff. It's good to see all of you. Today, what I want to do is I want to take you on a slightly different journey. I'm, I'll share my screen in just a few moments here. Uh, I understand. I'm, I'm proud. I always love when there's different platforms across the nation that are really engaging in trying to shift and change the culture and dynamics of, of lifestyle and really trying to combat disease early on. You know, a lot, a lot of times I'll joke with patients and I'll tell them there was a movie years ago and that movie was with uh, Tom Cruise. It was called The Minority Report. And so in this movie, I don't know if any of you out there are movie junkies like, like I am. My, my wife loves the movies, so we watch lots of movies. And so Tom Cruise's job was to go back inside of time and to stop a crime before it ever started. He would arrest a victim before they committed the crime. And so what, what, what modules, what pods like this are doing is you all to, together collectively are going back from your future selves, you're sent backwards to direct yourselves on eating healthfully, eating the right foods, the antioxidant rich, the fiber foods. So then that way you're able to, to prevent the disease that's lurking beneath the uh, surface there. So I'm proud of, of what you all are doing. And so today we're gonna take a slightly different approach. Let me go ahead and try to uh, share my screen here. And I've been made a co-host, so this should be possible. All right, and you all should see that up on the screen. So we're gonna dive into it. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> I learned early on was starting out is 2020 has been extremely altering of everything in life. <laughs> everything has just shifted tremendously as it relates to uh, 2020. And one of the things is that it's made me think that our greatest threat that we have, oftentimes I used to think about this. I remember applying for med school saying, well, what is the greatest threat to the existence of humankind that I can intervene as a, as a physician. And 2020 has made me rethink things. I started thinking that after 2020 hit that maybe the greatest threat is this thing called SARS-CoV. Maybe it's COVID-19, the coronavirus is the greatest thing. And as I look at these daily reports that John Hopkins puts out, and I see the impact that's happened worldwide uh, from a death toll to the impact of COVID-19, it made me really start to think that yes, indeed, maybe I was wrong, that, that the greatest threat is really these communicable diseases. The greatest threat was something called SARS-CoV. But I remember stumbling upon this article shortly ago, and this article came out of Cleveland area, and it, it told us the fact that there are an increased amount of broken heart syndromes that are happening. I don't know if any of you have heard of the broken heart syndrome. And so the broken heart syndrome, we're seeing that nearly sevenfold increased level of broken heart syndrome, not related to SARS-CoV virus. That we're seeing what the broken heart syndrome is really what's called the stress-induced cardiomyopathy. It's formed as a result of stress. And, and it brought my memory back to early on in my career. I remember seeing this young vi uh, female full of vitality. She was successful. She exuded success. She was a lawyer. She, had, she, she ran a practice. She made six figures. She was doing exceptionally well. And I remember seeing her in my office as she had these major catastrophic events. Her dog had just died. She had lost her parent. That she had a relationship that was on the, the cusp of breaking. And she described having intense pain that we thought she was having a classic heart attack. But taking her into the hospital, we realized quickly she didn't have a heart attack. She actually had what's called the broken heart syndrome, a true phenomenon in which the heart lo no longer contracts. It ceases to contract. It's called Takotsubo disorder from a massive surge in the stress hormone cascade. And this is what really rephrased frame my, my thought process that maybe the greatest threat is not just classic coronary disease, that the greatest threat facing Americans is stress, is stress. That evil six letter word, S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, stress. 
Now, we all know that we all need a little stress, and some of us work a little bit better off of stress. When a deadline is due, all of a sudden we perform. All of a sudden, everything seems to come full throttle. In that instance, we see performers like athletes perform under pressure. Tom Brady, or I'm sorry, the, 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 the we're in Minnesota here, right? <laughs> oh, no, this is Wisconsin. This is oh, Aaron my Aaron gosh. Aaron. Oh, my gosh. Brett Aaron Favre. Rodgers. Brett Favre. I was thinking Brett Favre and thinking Brett Favre went to the Vikings and broke you all's heart and caused Taco Subu for many of you out there in Milwaukee. <laughs> and so we know, <laughs> but we know too much of a, of a, of a good thing can be a bad thing. But in general, I like to kind of comment that stress equals demands minus resources. That when we feel that the demands of life outweigh our resources, that's when we perceive stress. We perceive stress in that instance, and we've become as a whole one nation under stress, as a matter of fact. And when, when we look at studies that have been done here recently, just this past year, that the majority of Americans are sensing a large degree of stress that 83% are, are concerned about the civil unrest, 66% are concerned really, excuse me, about, about the future of our nation as a source of stress. That there's others, parents, I'm a parent, I have a 13 year old, I have a 15 year old, and this transition to homeschooling has been something else. And so I, like many others, they feel the stress of managing distance online learning for their kids, the basic needs for some who are, who are frontline workers, how are they going to act, deal with going to work with their while their kids are at home? The isolation, access to healthcare, missing out on major milestones, birthdays and weddings and even funerals. How can you commem commemorate someone's life in this era of social isolation? And so we see this, we see that folks are concerned about family members getting coronavirus, about the government's response to coronavirus, about the disruption in the routines. My own wife has been just aching, her heart aching of wanting to go and travel back from California to her, her birthplace, or I should say where she grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and letting her know that, listen, this may not be the right time about going on vacations that we had to cancel. And so there's a great deal of stress that our nation is under. There's others who are feeling a great deal of stress simply as it relates to the economy, to their jobs, as we see major shutdowns of many institutions around the nation, many colleges that rely upon tuition, rely upon different avenues, are having to make cutbacks because of the stress related. So much so, this stress that's going on, a recent study came out showing that anxiety-related Google searches are on a high, on an all-time high, record high during these early stages of the pandemic. We're seeing tremendous amounts, but it doesn't just end there. It doesn't end with our average American. It also extends to those who are delivering care, those who are deemed and knighted with the responsibility of caring for us, that we're seeing that, that there's huge physician burnout that was starting even prior to the coronavirus pandemic, that there's huge nursing burnout. We've seen the stories, the tragedies of, of, of a physician committing suicide as a result of the overwhelming stress of the things that they were seeing. So not only does our stress equals our demands minus our resources, when we feel that our resources are not large enough to meet our demands, we feel this sense of stress, but I wanna to propose to you today a slightly different approach to this idea of lifestyle, that our health also is tied uniquely to our stress. You see, our health equals our resiliency over our stress. The higher our stress, the poorer our health. The higher our stress, the poorer our health. You know, you all may be saying, well, it's just stress. Deal with it, buckle up, be stronger, have some mental fortitude. But I want to tell you that there are things that happen beneath the surface that you may not be aware of because studies have shown us that chronic exposure to stress along with poor social supports, isolation, right? This almost sounds like this study, which was done back in 2001, was speaking to the COVID uh, situation 2020. Chronic exposure to stress, poor social supports, limited social networks, have been shown to have an increased disease risk. These studies have, have, have two shown, excuse me, have two shown that, that just simply having, oh, technology, yes, and my patience, 
for it, which can be a stressor too, as well, is that when you become impatient, it's another means. We'll talk about that too as well. But when you perceive stress, you increase your risk of cancer, right? Just by perceiving stress, it can impact your, your body processing. We're all in this constant battle against, against cancer, right? There's some estimates that 40% of women by the age of 40 have microscopic evidence of, of breast cancer cells. That, 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 that 50% of men by the time that they're in their 50s have uh, a precancerous uh, prostate cancer cells that are there. That nearly 100% by the time that you're in your 70s and 80s of thyroid microscopic evidence of thyroid cancer. And so we know that our body's in this constant struggle against illness versus wellness. And this perceived stress, it also increases as a predictor of diabetes, independent of your financial status, independent of your weight, that these risk factors play a substantial role. Perceived stress increases the risk of heart disease. It's been shown and associated with coronary artery calcification, increased incidence of coronary heart disease. Just by perceiving stress, whether it was real or manufactured in your brain, we know that there's increased risk as it pertains to stroke. So yes, indeed, we see there is a relationship between our health and our, our stress. Perceived stress in Alzheimer's disease. We know in general that this low social support, it confers a risk, the increased risk, 1.5 to 2.0, 2 point, excuse me, two times, both in healthy populations and those established with coronary heart disease. Yes, indeed, this meta-analysis has shown that, that when a person is depressed, self-reported depressive symptoms, that increases your risk for cardiovascular events and mortality, a form of stressor that's there. Our health equals our resiliency divided by our stress. But, but how does this happen? Well, many of you have heard the likes in the, the lecture of Dr. Esselstyn, and he loves to talk about this magical pathway. It says all roads lead back to, to, to the heart. All roads lead to this, this issue of disease. And it's called, the, it's lined by something called the endothelium. This endothelium is a magical substance that's there. I, I like to think of it as having superpowers <laughs> is what this endothelium has. It's special lining, it's resilient. It's almost like a Teflon pan. I don't know if any of you guys have ever cooked on Teflon pans. You can you can crack an egg, although you shouldn't, you're not really eating those, hopefully, anymore. You can, you can put cheese on it, although you're not really having that much anymore. And nothing will stick to it. It's, resil it's resistant. It's resilient. And so we know that this, this endothelium, it's packed. It can, it, can, it can dilate. It can leap over a building with a single bound. It can dilate vessels. It can inhibit growth. It can prevent clot from forming. It can prevent inflammation. Is when the endothelium, that special lining, is intact. But when it becomes dysfunctional, just like that, that Teflon pan, we've all used a Teflon pan and we've seen it over the years get wear and tear. And now you didn't have to put any substance on it to keep it from things from sticking. Then you have to spray Pam on it. Now you have to put oil, layers of, of oil, which hopefully you're not using any longer to prevent anything from sticking to it. This is the same thing that happens to your endothelium slowly but surely, as it becomes dysfunctional, now it constricts instead of dilates. It promotes growth in narrowing as opposed to preventing the growth. It's more inclined to developing clots sticking to it and to become inflamed. So in other words, it becomes your teenage child. I have teenagers, I told you, prone towards these pimples that can burst and erupt and show up on the inner linings of the vessels is essentially what happens that, that when they explode, it leads to catastrophic events that can lead to what a heart attack. So, so this endothelium we know can become is dysfunctional and how do we say that it's related to stress? Well, there's been studies that have been done that show that when we have emotional and physical stress, that studies have shown the, the hormonal level inside of our body becomes disrupt. As we see this now, it increases the likelihood of impairing blood flow and leading to this catastrophic freezing of the heart muscle contractility, leading to what we call broken heart syndrome. Takosubu disorder is what we see in this instance. Now, so is there any way that we can know if our, if our arteries are prone, if our endothelium is healthy? Well, there is. We actually can do it in our office. Now, most of us don't because we're pretty busy, but studies have shown 
that what we can do, think of it like your pipe, excuse me, your, your water hose that you get from your local hardware store. And if you, were, if you live where I live in Southern California, I live in the nestle between Disneyland and Bob Hope Land called Palm Springs. And so Palm Springs is basically a desert. And so what would happen if you left a water hose that you buy from the, gross, from the hardware store, you were to press on that water hose, it would compress nicely and it would bounce back. Now imagine what happens when you put that pipe inside of the, that water hose inside of the desert. The heat's going to get to it. The rubber is going to become rigid. It's no longer going to compress. So in this study, what we do is we measure, we measure what was called the reactive hyperemic phase of it. And we see, does the vessel respond? Does it bounce back and dilate or not? And it's something that we can assess with the ultrasound and we call this flow mediated dilatation. Does it dilate as there's increased flow after restricting the flow for a short period of time? And it tells us whether or not the artery is functioning. And so studies have shown that with mental stress, it impairs that vascular response, propagating the likelihood of this thing called takosubu disorder. Now you're saying, well, doc, how's all this related to me and to eating well? I thought we were gonna talk about eating well. Well, we're gonna get there. So remember, our health equals our resiliency divided by our stress. When we look at the endothelial function, this lining of the vessels, what studies have distinctly shown is the fact that those who, who, are, who suffer more so with, um, uh, at, during an acute stressor, they're going to be more inclined to have poor responsivity to, with their, with, to the endothelium function, to their artery functioning in comparison. And this has been consistently demonstrated. Even here, we look at, when we look at those who, be, uh, those who have mental stressors, the responsiveness goes down, right? In time, it will go back up. It's same as eating a burger. It will impair you over time. It will dissipate unless you give it another insult. So imagine those who have constant stress on a repetitive basis. They start off, wake up in the morning stressed as they look at, the, at their phone. They continue to be stressed as they get to their job. They continually are stressed at lunch and when they get home, they're having unabated impacts on their endothelium that leads to problems. We see that with depression too as well, that it's in those who are treated, they've received the cognitive therapy, perhaps the pharmacologic therapy, that they have improved arterial functionality compared to those who are not treated. We know that with chronic stress, we see too as well the same issue happen with those, the responsiveness. Those who are under more stress versus those, excuse me, those who are under more stress versus those who report less stress. The responsivity of their, of their vasculature, it varies accordingly, is what we see on a regular basis. Now here's the key. The endothelial dysfunction not only is predictive of, the, uh, excuse me, of an issue as is responsive to stress, if there's damage to that endothelium, it predicts future events, strokes and heart attacks, is what we know. It also predicts the risk of developing hypertension. So people who, have, who, who start off, this study looked at 952 healthy individuals, women, 44 to 60, and it followed them for about three and a half years. And it, what they found is over 112 developed high blood pressure. The relative risk of developing high blood pressure during follow-up was 5.8 fold in those with the, uh, with the, the poorest flow mediated dilatation, which means that their body, it, was, it was not responsive at all. It's predictive of developing an event. Same thing occurs here with diabetes that there is an increased risk as it pertains to developing diabetes for those who have the poorest responsivity of their endothelial function. There's a correlation that's there. As a matter of fact, vascular dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction is associated with many, many things. Now, can you all guess what else vascular dysfunction has been recently associated with? a severe outcome from the coronavirus is what studies are also starting to tell us. And there's hypotheses being generated as this novel virus, we're learning more and more about it. So our health is indeed tied to our resiliency over stress. And what do many of us do when we get stress? We turn to our good old friends. In this picture, it's a, a cake, but I know many people who turn to a double date. They go out with Ben and Jerry's. They have a good time eating. And they may say that it's vegan style. I'm having vegan style, whatever it may be, but they turn to this. They're desserts. In that instance is what they turn to 
as a means for them to feel better because they're stressed and stress fell backwards is simply what? Desserts. So what this new aspect of stress has told me, it's told me that there is indeed another threat. And that threat is not just stress, but it's something called nutritional stress. You see, nutritional stress is really, it's, yes, it's eating disease-forming foods, but it's also not eating enough health-promoting foods. Now, if you don't believe me, there's a recent study that came out, recent article just this past July that said, what's the greatest threat, once again, to the U.S. national security? It's poor diets. It's poor diets as the rate of obesity is increasing, as the rate of comorbidities is increasing, even preventing folks from joining our military. There's so much issues, so many issues that, that are there. And what we're seeing is that we're seeing people across the board are, are the enemy. They're, they're confused about who the enemy is. You see, many of us, we like to hide. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm going to pause for a second. And so I will apologize in advance. My wife tells me this all the time not to do it. And I don't listen despite 22 years of marriage. She says, be gentle. Don't go in that hard at people. But I'm going to go in hard today. Right. See, the, the issue, many of us, we like to, to hide on our soapbox and we like to say, well, I, I'm vegan. Uh, I, I'm gluten free. I'm this. And I want to tell you today, the greatest enemy is the standard American diet. The greatest enemy is the standard American diet full of refined processed foods, high in salt, sugar and fat that loads our dinner, our, our grocery store tables. What we're seeing is that just like in this pandemic, I just need the comfort. I just want to, to avert the stress as these processed foods make a comeback where people were starting to kind of maybe perhaps veer away from them. They're increasing at astronomical rates as individuals feel this stressor and their dietary habits have shifted even if they had started improving. It may be a vegan version of a comfort food, but it's still comfort food, something to take away the pain. And so many of us may sit back on our high horse and we say, well, you think you, you have a choice, make a better choice. But many live inside communities, communities filled with weapons of mass destruction. They live in communities where there's fast food restaurants on every corner. That every time that they, they, they blink, there's a fast food restaurant. And studies have shown, if you just live in proximity to a fast food restaurant, it increased the likelihood of, of heart attacks. There was a study that was shown, uh, that was done that showed that, that if you eat fast food about once a week or so, it increased your risk of heart attack. This is at the University of Minnesota about 20 times, right? If you go two or three times per week, it increases it 40 to 50 times and, and four or five times, it's over 60 times the increased risk of heart attacks. And this is a small number of individuals that were followed, but it still was powerful when when tethered together with multiple other studies, that there is a problem that's there. That eating the foods, right, that are subsidized by our government, and we understand that, full of salt, sugar, and fat, it increases your risk of having obesity, increases your risk of diabetes, of this metabolic syndrome that's going on, this inflammatory. I joke with the staff as they go down and they joke with me and they, they come back with their less than healthy food, the fried this or bacon that. And they say, oh, doc, you know, that's what I have for, for lunch because they know, understand the importance of nutrition from my perspective. And I said, I said, that's okay. You guys are on the inflammatory diet instead of the anti-inflammatory diet is what, is what you're doing and you're trying to keep me gainfully employed. But the problem, once again, is salt, sugar, and fat that essentially we've manufactured this addictive state that's there. And the food we are eating now is creating stress in our bodies, this nutritional stress. Yes, that when we choose to eat, partake of animal products and we look at salt, sugar, and fat, and starting with fat, and we look at the food, but at first we thought, oh, it's just all the fat. Well, it's more than that. It's the animal protein. There's a huge process and studies have shown that even when they took individuals and compared their ingestion of animal products compared to, to legumes, lentils in that particular instance, they showed that the salivary cortisol levels increased astronaut, they increased over a time period with those ingesting the animal products and decreased when you ingested the whole grains, the whole, the, the legumes that were there. That studies have shown that what about antioxidants? Well, we know antioxidants are good. We talked about, I saw the recipes that were being shown with the, the different breakfast bowls and they had the berries and berries are the best thing. Studies have shown that your mentation of school kids can improve by eating blueberries. 
Here's one key thing when it comes to antioxidants. If the fruit you eat doesn't turn brown immediately, it's rich and robust in antioxidants. So you think of your blueberries, your raspberries, your strawberries, your pomegranate seeds. So my normal concoction for every morning for myself is I'll have I'll have blueberries and raspberries and strawberries, and I love the pomegranate seeds. It gives it a great little flavor that's there that I'm loading my body with antioxidants to help fight disease that's there. And so studies have even been done looking at the role of antioxidants on the endothelium. And they've shown that when they've given the form of an antioxidant, vitamin C, to individuals who we already know have damaged endothelium, right, with an autoimmune disorder, they have found that it's able to improve the function by adding these nutrient-rich products to the dietary intake. There's power to reverse it, and there's power in your choices in the foods that you eat and the foods that were just being described. There's something else that is oftentimes not discussed very much, and that is advanced glycated end products, glycation end products. And, and so I, the easiest way is that these things age you. They're found primarily inside of animal products, although they can be found in some plant-rich um, foods. And it's essentially, it results in this, what's called Maillard reaction, this browning. For those of you out there who cook, the browning of foods, the making of your gravy, that certain crisp that you like to get, the burn marks that are there, some of the many substances that are generated, some of it is really the advanced glyca glycation end products. And studies have been, they've even done studies looking very specifically at meals with low amounts of advanced glycation end products. So once again, your meats that are fried, they're grilled, those sorts of things all generate it. But it's an interaction between your sugar and the protein is what ends up happening typically and will lend itself to it. But the studies have shown that in those with a lower amount of advanced glycation in products, their, dil their dilation of their vessels was much more improved than those with a higher amount of glycation. But they didn't stop there. They also looked at markers of inflammation and found that these markers of inflammation were actually, uh, not surprisingly, were higher in those who ingested the elevated or the high advanced glycation in product meals. There's power in our food choices that are there. Another study basically showing that the higher the quartiles of, of the advanced glycation uh, in products, the more problematic of, the, of a species called nitrogen oxide uh, reductase. The activity shifted accordingly. It down-regulated, which means that it can interfere with the functionality of the endothelium, looking mechanistically at how this was undertaken inside the cells. There's another thing that's produced that we know as a result of eating these fatty, these animal products, and you all have probably heard about it, it's trimethylamine oxide. Now, another movie, I, I told you we're movie buffs here in this in my household, is called Venom. Venom is a superhero movie. And what's interesting about Venom is that it really is about an alien that's looking for the perfect host. Now, in the wrong host, it will kill it. But in the right host, this alien will go on to fight disease. Group thing. There was a cardiologist from California. And, uh, and Terry. I we're hearing your conversation, so I mean, uh, there nope, too nope, as well. That's, we... uh, that's somebody else, and I, oh. I would ask, I would ask yeah. everybody to mute until the end of Dr. Columbus and during Q and A, uh, or uh, it, it, comments and uh, questions can be asked. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. So the TMAO, this trimethylamine oxide, basically, as I was alluding to with the analogy of the of the superhero. It will kill the host that's the wrong host for it. But in the right host, you can go on to fight and do phenomenal things to, to save people's lives. And so in our body, we have, as you all may have heard, more gut bacteria than we have human DNA. We have more gut or bacterial DNA than we have human DNA. And so as a result of this, our bacteria can dictate so many aspects of our life from having disease to having depression all of those aspects. It's so entirely powerful, even so that there are researchers who are looking to do something called fecal transplants <laughs> to bring, to give people the poop from other people to help spur on and improve their outcomes. And so what say there is a particular bacteria that can be spurred on an increase in a, a substance when carnitine, which can be found in many products, but primarily animal products, is ingested, it's converted over to trimethylamine. 
and then oxidize um, from gut bacteria. And this can be atherogenic. It can be toxic. It can lead to coronary artery disease. And that's one of the issues. And so what we know is that once you ingest these animal products and it, it, it heightens this aging process as it produces the increased amounts of trimethylamine oxide, which then lends itself to once again, this endothelial dysfunction, this lining. So this is more the why. Why, as we look at this idea of nutritional stress. And very similar to the other slides, once again, the higher the amount of trimethylamine oxide, the poorer the response of the, of the arteries, the flow media dilatation. But also they looked at, once again, the role of ascorbic acid or vitamin C and looking to see, does it aid or help in this? And it shows that it does help. Uh, to as well. So once again, supplementing one's diet with antioxidants is extremely powerful, using our food for a benefit. Then we look to as well at the heart of things, what do many of us love? We love sweeteners, we love sugars. And so studies, once again, I love, I, I, I describe myself as a recovering sugarholic, right? And so whole food is, is great for you, but refined process is not so much. And so people will say, Doc, what do you think about sugar? Is sugar bad? That means I can't have fruit. I thought you just said eat berries and strawberries. And I say, no, if it's wrapped within the bounty of fiber, that's different. It's almost like if I gave my wife a 22-year wedding anniversary gift that I forgot to give her. So I reached in my pocket and I gave her a $10 bill. She would not be happy with me, not just because it's only $10, but because there was no thought. There was nothing wrapped. But if I gave her whatever I bought her in a nice box, that was wrapped beautifully and she took her time to un undo the bow, to tear open the paper as she's wondering, did he buy me a brand new car? Did he get me a brand new house? That now the excitement, the anticipation would, would lend itself. Well, the same thing happens in the body. That when you ingest food that's wrapped in fiber, your body has to unravel it. It has to take it apart. The fiber plays a role in your health. Now the sugar doesn't shoot straight up really high. It has a chance to disseminate nice and slow. And so these studies have shown that, that essentially that with sugar sweetened beverage, it also decreases the flow mediated dilatation and, uh, and the dilatation inside the arteries. And so there is, once again, another impact inside of the uh, arterial tree. Well, what about salt? We all love salt. Same thing happens with salt, is that salt is not just about fluid retention, that the salt actually can help assist in damaging the endothelium. It too, as well, has been shown to decrease this thing called the flow media dilatation. And when individuals were given this high salt meal, that they once again showed a poor response compared to those who were given a low salt meal. So for those who are suffering with high blood pressure, those who are suffering with heart disease, um, it can be extremely powerful. That's severe. When we look at the stress and the impact on the heart, it increases. A recent study just came, I didn't include it here, but it talked about what's called diastolic dysfunction, which means your heart gets stiffer during that time. And so it can worsen one's symptoms and making you more subjugated towards ill events that are there. So what are the results of this nutritional stress? What are the, indeed the results of this, this diffuse nature of, of westernized foods that we've kind of delivered across the world? Well, we've become colonizers. We have shifted the world completely to the way in which we like to do things. And so as a result, the world has taken on chronic disease and nearly 71% now there's communicable diseases are the result of deaths you know, globally, worldwide. Inside of America, we know there's substantial amounts. We're seeing all of these deaths occur as a result of non-communicable diseases. You know, we're, we're facing right now and, the, and our nation is really coming to grips with the issue concerning a communicable disease and that of the coronavirus. But when we speak of non-communicable diseases, they are not transmitted by me speaking with you. They are not transmitted by me uh, touching certain things and you coming behind and touching, or me singing or singing happy birthday or whatever it may be. These non-communicable diseases are powerful and historically are the ways in which many of us have succumbed to illness unnecessarily. We look at the data and we see that, that 40, that six in 10 adults have at least one chronic disease. Four in 10 adults have at least two or more diseases. It's no surprise that we've succumbed to this really thing called coronavirus, that we've led the world 
in not only uh, the, the higher acuity deaths, as we look at those who have been hospitalized, the greatest risk factors are those where there's endothelial damage of those who are of obesity, those who have this, that which lends itself towards an inflammatory state, this chronic low-grade inflammatory state. There's no doubt of the fact with high blood pressure, no doubt with coronary artery disease, with underlying lung issues that are there that propagate this scenario. But the good news is that it is indeed never too late to change the direction that you're going, on, you're going your life is going in. I tell folks all the time, they say, well, doc, do you really think it can happen? And there's a great, a great quote by an author, his name is Alexander Chase. And he says, a shocking occurrence ceases to become shocking when it occurs daily. So I'm no longer surprised when I see the great stories of how folks have transformed their lives, of how they're doing better, they're living better lives, that they're no longer having to take as many medications or in some instances, no medications whatsoever as a result of really transforming themselves. And so one of the things I really admonish, I encourage folks to do is to get selfish. You have to get selfish with your health. And what do I mean by get selfish? I mean, when I say get selfish, I mean that the S stands for spiritual. It means meditation. It means mindfulness that you have a moment. It means gratitude. And so I, amidst all of this storm of, 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 of adversity that the country is facing right now, having moments to be able to say, what am I grateful for? What am I grateful for? Having moments to kind of think and reflect and moments of silence called meditation and its impact on your health. What does the E stand for? Exercise. Although I'm a heretic and I, I don't believe in exercise, I believe in movement. I believe in staying active. I believe in, in being purposeful in your activities. But if you can't do that, then exercise and the power that's there. I believe the L stands for love, right? We're going to talk about that love because love is something that we're lacking in this release of oxytocin, which is also released during the stress hormone cascade. You see, what happens is that when you get stressed, when you recognize something that is stressful, that's fearful, fear provoking, your brain goes through this sequence where it activates the stress hormone cascade. But it also triggers another hormone called oxytocin, the love hormone, the hug hormone, that causes us to seek out social connectivity, social bonds. And here's the thing about the oxytocin hormone. It's been shown in some instances to have receptors that can help dilate the vessels to allow improvement and healing of the heart. And so there's so much power that's there. The F we know stands for food. It stands for real food. I, I tell people all the time, we love to think of our celebrities in terms of, of, of singular names. Giselle, Tom, Brett, right? You know, Prince. We, we, we go through Madonna. We, we go through these different things by singular names. I tell you, go for the celebrity all-stars with your food with singular names, broccoli. Apple, kale, carrots, onions, berries. You want the same thing. Those are the ones who are going to give you the greatest power, the greatest impact to your body are those things with singular names that are out there. The I stands for intimacy. Now, intimacy doesn't mean a sexual way. Intimacy means a bond with someone. It means that it could be a pet. right? We have these, we have these animals that are there that my mom is 85, lives with me. Her dog knows when she's in pain. It will sit by her. Her dog knows if she's having troubles, if she's sad, and will just sit and lay on her lap. That's an intimate relationship. And those are important as we talked about the social disconnectivity that can lead to, to increased chronic disease. Social connectivity can help offset chronic disease. What's the second S for? Second S is for sleep. A third of our lives we spend in sleep and we think it's for nothing, but it's so important. It's so important as it relates to our ability to achieve our goals of weight loss or, or achieve our goals of diabetes control or to see, achieve our goals, a really thought process. What's the last letter stand for? H is for humor, it's for laughter. Having a moment to laugh and the value and what it does to the body is so powerful there on a regular basis. So am I telling a lie or is this all related? Can you be selfish and can it help your endothelium? Absolutely, because studies have shown that when your mood shifts, that when you get a little happy, when you have time to kind of meditate, that all of a sudden the arteries begin to, to dilate a little bit more. That studies have shown that when you engage in, in this thing, this you know, activity with yoga, right, and exercise, that all of a sudden that we find out that the arteries become more reactive, they dilate 
more than what they did at baseline. That's, that studies too have shown that when you walk along with engaging in meditation, walking alone, you achieve this improvement into in the flow dilatation that your arteries improve. But when you walk and you, you engage in meditation, right? That S and that E of selfish, all of a sudden your arteries dilate that much more. There's power in our choices even beyond the food. Studies have shown that these exercises and engaging, it can help reduce your systemic inflammation. It can help bolster and embolden your, your body's defense mechanisms. So then that way you are able and more sound in ability to fight the viral loads, to fight diabetes and all these other ailments and to improve your, your sense of well-being, which becomes important. I told you about L and the love and, and the oxytocin and that role that it plays. It's so powerful as we look at oxytocin and what it does to the arteries, to the bonding. And so it's so important to engage in that as much as possible. Taking a moment, what do you do for others? I'm, I'm giving gratitude under the S at the beginning, but the L, my love, is, a, is an action. It's an action. Am I giving of my time? in my community and, and things of that nature becomes equally important. But what about the food? Well, studies have shown you get away from the saturated fat. As you move away from saturated, as you get more and more saturated fat, there goes your flow, your, your arteries ability to dilate. It's lower at the higher amounts of fat. At the lower amounts of fat, the better your arteries are able to dilate, as well as it was shown with other aspects in terms of the markers of inflammation. This is the Ornish diet. This is another component. Ornish has done phenomenal work inside this field. It's really laid the foundation, the groundwork that there is a precedent that food can impact the arterial function. It can impact your telomeres, the lengths of your, of your, uh, your DNA, that it can impact prostate cancer. There's so much power that's there. Says have shown that this intensive lifestyle that when you engage in it compared to just eating the same old, same old standard American diet, that your endothelial function can improve. The food is indeed powerful. Now, here's the crazy part. And I mentioned this before, as I'm learning more and more and diving into some of the biological research, we're there, we know that this thing called the coronavirus attaches to something called the ACE2 receptor. And here's the thing, with the ACE2 receptor, there's a small group that's been doing some study and what they hypothesized and looked at is that this upregulation of the ACE2 receptor, right? By upregulating it, you can, de you can improve or decrease the severity of the, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV illness crisis. And so where are some of the things that can, can upregulate it? Low fat, low saturated fat, increasing where's resveratrol found? It's found in some of your berries and some of your grapes and some of your legumes is where it's found. And so these are the things that are become extremely important for finding this connectivity. There's studies that have shown that, that broccoli rabbit that it can increase in natural killer T cells. That are there, some of the early frontline uh, defenders against viral loads that are there. Now, many of the studies have been done in, in looking at uh, influenza and other standard viruses as opposed to sars cov but it makes sense that there could be some extrapolation over into what we're experiencing now. When we look at this thing called uh, the I, the intimacy in our social network, it becomes important that there was a study where they actually dropped rhinovirus inside the nose and those who report a high social network, right? They have a good connectivity, a good community that they're a part of. They had a lower likelihood of developing the illness from the, the virus that was injected into their nose. Those who had the lowest support system had the highest likelihood of developing the illness. That those who had the highest level of stress were more likely in another very similar study were more likely to catch a cold. It's so important, our stress. It's not solely our food. The food is the central component, right? It is the buttress. It is the central component. And looking at real food, whole food, plant-rich foods as a predominance of our diet and preferentially as a sole means of our dietary experience. But it's also the other components of the, of the stress and the variables that are there. So much so that when we look at sleep, once again, Sleep is a beautiful thing. I look at my kids, I look at my God kids and they sleep so peacefully. And it's like, wow, how did I lose that sleep? That's so wonderful like that. But studies have shown that, that the, the changes in terms of when you're sleep deprived, you get less of this, 
dilatation that's there, it becomes like the issue. That's really where the problem is. So there's studies that have confirmed this too as well. Studies have shown that with laughter, that when individuals across all areas engage and just find something that's humor filled, something that's helpful for them, that they're able to improve their full media dilatation, that their, their compliance of their vessels, how distensible it is, improves astronomically. There is indeed power. And so I want to encourage you once again, it's time to get selfish. We have to indeed get selfish with our care. We have to prioritize ourselves. We have to put the, the oxygen mask on ourselves first and then look to help others as a secondary correlate in order for us to achieve the health we're really desiring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Batiste. That is outstanding. Great information. Um, and we have uh, a little bit of time left for Q&A here. We may go a little over, guys. We're, we probably have about eight, uh, 10 minutes before 7.30. And Dr. Batiste, are you available for some Q&A? Yes. Uh, yes. So I, why don't, uh, if people go back to the chat function, um, and uh, type uh, things in there, we'll be able to, um, I'll, I'll watch for them coming up. In the meantime, one of the first things I'd like to ask you is, I love hearing about stories, uh, and being a chief of cardiology, you've seen a lot of patients come through. What have, what have you seen from people who have, you know, really taken this, you talked about adherence in Dr. Ornish's study, who really uh, take to this and adhere to it uh, as far as changes in, in their health? No, absolutely. It's a great story. And I mean, it's a great point. And I see, I've seen it a fair amount. And I'll, I would be misleading if I told you every patient engaged the same level every single time. And that's not the case whatsoever. But in those who have it, my memory goes back to an individual who I saw in clinic who was having a great deal of trouble even walking across the, um, the, the lobby to see me without stopping with chest discomfort. And he, he sought me out in second opinion in, in order to decide about having a stent or having a procedure, which I agreed. I was so concerned in that moment that he needed to go in to have an angiogram to look at the arteries of his heart. So when I took a look at the arteries in, in his heart and we went in, um, there was a gasp in the room, you know, at the extensiveness of the blockage. And here's the thing, the blockage was so extensive where stenting would not resolve the complete picture. It was not going to improve his longevity. He was not in a setting of an acute heart attack. Um, and I questioned how strongly the surgeons would be able to perform complete revascularization based upon the extensiveness of disease. But that really in that moment, even for myself as a practicing lifestyle provider, a believer in, the, in, in what I deliver prescription of, of nutrition, I felt this guy perhaps may have benefited from surgery. And so I remember talking with him afterwards, I mentioned to him, you know what, sir, I think we may have to consider surgery. And he looked at me and he said, well, I want to talk to you in clinic first as I'm still recovering from this medication. I saw him back in clinic with his wife. And whenever I see the spouse there, I'm always concerned. <laughs> you know, that's usually a marker for men. They're not doing quite as well because men like to be very reserved and do not like to, to give the information. And so came in and, and I weighed, I discussed, I reviewed the images with him. And he said, I'm not going to, I'll do anything else but that. I said, well, sir, if you go across the country, generally most folks are going to recommend this. Are you sure? He said, yes. I said, okay. Well, what, he said, what else can you do? I said, I'll put you onto our cardiac rehab program and start you very slow. I want you to go on the a salt, oil, and sugar-free whole food plant-based diet, right? I, we're going to minimize your oils all the way down. I want you to have good whole food fats. So you'll have chia and you'll have flax and, and you're going to have measured amounts of, of walnuts and so forth that are there for your omegas. But other than that, it's only going to be whole food. And he left, and I'll be honest, I felt a little nervous. One week went by, two weeks went by, I told him to give me a call, didn't hear anything. Three weeks went by, four weeks, five weeks, I see him back towards the, the end. And, and I see him in clinic, and he's with his wife. And I say, oh boy, I told you once again, the marker for me is I see this spouse, I know there's problems. And, and he said, I said, so true to form, I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing great, doc. I said, really? I said, what does that mean? What does great mean? He said, well, I did what you said and, and I, I, I changed the game. I'm not, I'm not having those symptoms anymore. 
I was able to walk. He said, I actually, the problem I'm having today, and I said, okay, now here it comes. I'm having pain on the bottom of my feet. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm having pain right here in my arch. I said, plantar fasciitis? I said, what have you been doing? He said, well, I've been playing golf <laughs> four days a week, walking the majority of the course. There's power in our choices. It does not mean that everyone is going to have the same outcome. It does not mean that I am against what I've been trained to do in terms of using um, uh, the tools of Western medicine of, of angiograms and angioplasty stenting and bypass surgery when needed. It does not mean I'm against the medications, but what I mean is that nutrition and lifestyle should not be an alternative care. It should be the primary care. It should be our primary focus. It should be our primary uh, prescription that's given. And we understand meeting the individual where they're at and what they're capable of doing or what they believe until we work with them. I tell the analogy all the time. It's just like, it's, it's my job is to replace a tire that's blown out on the freeway or that has been shredded. But I also need to give that driver the tools necessary to keep them from driving over a, bale of, uh, a bed of nails or for backing up over the spikes. I have to give them that information so in that way we can stop the, the vicious turn. Excellent, thank you, Doctor. And, and just a quick note to everybody. Um, uh, apparently we're having a little bit of a problem with the chat function. So if you type it in and you don't see it come up for everyone, uh, I am getting many of these through, pri through the privately. So if you go ahead and continue to type them in, I will, uh, I'll go through as many of these as I can. Um, so uh, let's see, we have uh, a, an individual who says, I'll be 66 in a couple of weeks. I feel good, eat well. Should I voluntarily get the brach brachial artery ultrasound? No, so one is, that's a great question. One is, I don't know that you'll find many in practice physicians who are going to be doing the brachial artery test or flow mediated dilatation. Number one, I think number two is the fact that what you, especially during the end life of COVID. Now, some simple things for you to get a gauge about what your level of, of uh, stress level is in your body is that if you have a wearable, if you have an Apple watch or you have a Samsung Galaxy watch, many of those watches will track your heart rate and, and they may actually also look at what's called heart rate variability. So think of it like this. If you're an uptight person, we equate those people to being highly stressed. They're very rigid. They, they don't modulate in their tone or anything else like that, right? So if you have a very narrow heart rate variability, it, it's probably infers probably an increase. It's not 100%, but gives us a, a, uh, some inference. If it's a wide heart rate variability, it tells us that, okay, you know what? Maybe you're under a little bit less stress. That when we look at your inflammatory markers, we may see too as well that your, your cholesterol levels are controlled and that your markers of inflammation um, are, are reduced there to some degree, and that may give us an inference. But at the end of the day, you know what you're doing for your health. You know if you're being selfish or not on a day in and day out basis. You know it. You don't need someone else to validate that or not. You know if you're being or not. Um, so that, that's, so that, that's a long way to answer that. I don't think you're going to find many practitioners who will be doing that in their office on a consistent basis because of the time involved. Uh, I'll, pit, I'll jump in here again for another quick uh, technical thing. Uh, anybody who's sending um, uh, questions, you might want to look me up in the uh, it, and send it uh, privately to me. Um, uh, let's see, what are your thoughts regarding coronary calcium score? So calcium, coronary calcium score, it's, it's, it's a useful modality for screening, for identifying markers of disease that a person has. And typically what we implement at that time is trying to identify, okay, the burden of, of using a, a cholesterol lowering medication. So it's helpful from that standpoint to let you know, do you have markers of external calcification, which is a marker of obviously vascular disease. So it's helpful as a screening. Do I do it on every patient? I personally do not adopt it on every patient. So once again, I work from the school of thought. If I look at this and I think about things realistically on the timeline, we know that studies have shown the beginnings of atherosclerosis begin before the age of 10. Many of you may have heard this already. 
we know that there are studies that have been done uh, Vietnam vets, Gulf War vets of those who survived, uh, those who succumbed to more vehicle accidents showing substantially obstructive coronary arteries at a very young age. So we know that there's progression that will vary in each individual, but typically manifesting in the ages of 30 to, 50 to, 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 to 40. But here's the key. Most heart attacks do not happen from areas that are 70, 80, 90%. The majority of heart attacks happen from areas of narrowing that are 20, 30, 40%. That means that they would never cause symptoms. That means that they would never show up typically on the EKG or better yet on a stress test. So that means from a standpoint of screening, you won't, you won't detect it, which is why people out there in the community have heard at times that this guy just went to the doc and was told everything was a-okay. They gave him blind co colors and told him he passed his stress test and then he died of a heart attack. It's because it's not predictive of a heart attack. It can tell us if there are significantly occlusive vessels, typically large caliber, things of that nature is what it will identify. So with all that stuff, that being said, is that it's more, it's equally as important to know your numbers. What's your blood pressure? What's your hemoglobin A1C? What's your, uh, your cholesterol? What's your weight like? These are things that are gangs. These are, are, are unsavory individuals who run in groups causing wreaking havoc in your community of your body. In, in destruction. And so focusing on getting those under control is the is paramount first, is what my recommendations always are to individuals. You know, and um, Terry, there's a question here from someone about, you know, about starting, how you start off um, kind of getting going and, um, and just really the level of stress and just something simple like breakfast. And I think that that's great. I think that it can seem so daunting I saw a patient, I'm gonna give you a real life story. I saw a patient today, he's 49. I first did the angiogram on him 12 years ago. Very young, young man. And so he was just, he was ashamed to come and see me, which I had to admonish him against being ashamed to come and see me because he had not stuck with what, with what he was supposed to be doing from a dietary standpoint. Because in his mind, I set the bar so high and it was too daunting for him to achieve despite his known existing coronary disease and so forth. And so I encouraged him and I said, listen, it's not about me and it's not about perfection. It's about where you're at starting. And so what I recommend to folks is choose one thing, whether it's breakfast, lunch, if you say breakfast, what do you normally have for breakfast? If you normally eat out a fast food place, it's like, okay, how can I make this a healthier version? You say, I don't like oatmeal. Okay, fine, we'll take oatmeal off the, off the docket. You say, well, I don't like smoothies. I like hot things. I don't like cold things. And so we begin to work and we figure out like, okay, you know what? Fine. Let's first see, can we do, I heard a wonderful discussion about tofu scramble or tofu bowl. Can I do that if eggs is my normal thing and make a breakfast burrito? Can I go ahead and say, okay, well, you know what? I will, I'm willing to retry the oatmeal. Can I be willing to try a bowl of fruit? Can I be willing to try um, a smoothie with less sugar if sugar's a thing? that really dissuades me. Can I have regular food for breakfast? Can I have beans and greens and various things, a regular bowl? I encourage folks, make it simple, make it fun. Use the bowl method. I know it can be tiresome, but when you go to certain establishments, they'll say, what kind of rice do you want? You want brown rice or you want white rice? Okay, do you want white rice, brown rice, or you want wild rice? Next thing, what kind of bean do you want? Okay, black beans, pinto beans, whatever it is, you choose your bean, add that next to your bowl. Next, they typically will come with some protein, not understanding that there's protein in the beans and, and the rice right already, but if you wanna go that route, you can say tempeh, or you can, have, you can have tofu, or add that there if you like, or just stick with the beans and the rice, then you add in your vegetables. Then next, you're going to add in something else that's going to add flavor, pico de gallo, whatever it may be. So what's my normal routine? I live, you know, my wife is not Betty Crocker. She can cook well, but she's not waiting with the newspaper and my slippers at the door when I walk in and walk out and have a meal on the table. So I have canned uh, salt-free beans in my, on my shelf. I have frozen rice in my freezer. I have frozen vegetables in my freezer. I can quickly make a bowl. I can quickly make a burrito with a blink of an eye. And so you want to make it simple. The last thing I'll say not to be too long-winded is that I believe in having a rewards calendar. Get your traditional calendar and you commit to one thing. Make it very tangible. I will have a half a cup of what type of fruit? Don't say fruit. Apple, grapes, 
oranges, whatever it may be. And you choose that as your starting point, you put an X every day you get that in. You say, I'm going to have a green vegetable, one cup of a green vegetable. Nope, don't say that. Is it going to be broccoli? Is it going to be kale? Is it going to be green peas? You put an X on the calendar every day. You're consistent with these small, tiny habits as you move and you build upon them. These are also called keystone habits. So what I gave you as a start when we go through the selfish mnemonic is that when you begin and engage in mindfulness and meditation, that's a keystone habit, a foundational habit. The exercise is a foundational habit that then you can build upon that a lot easier to achieve your goals. And that's one of the things that's important. Thank you, Doctor. I'm going to throw something in here quickly and then you can go to another question and we'll, we'll probably do about five or 10 more minutes here. Um, you know, for somebody who's starting out, something that I recommend, um, number one is choose uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains that you like. And find things that you already like. If, you're, if, you're not, if you don't like it, you know, don't force yourself to eat things that you don't like or, and, or, or you won't stay on it uh, for very long. Uh, and then secondly, there is something um, called the Beginner's Guide to a Plant-Based Diet uh, that Forks Over Knives puts out. So if you Google Forks Over Knives Beginner's Guide to a Plant-Based Diet, you'll come up with a very well put together uh, explanation of, uh, of why you might have an interest in going plant-based and how you go about it and it will have links. Uh, if you print it off, it's only about four pages long. Uh, but if you, if you do it uh, online, there will be links there to recipes. There'll be links to success stories. There'll be links to other things like that. And it is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the easiest uh, uh, way to go about uh, doing, uh, to go about starting. Thank you very much, Dr. and Terry. Sure, happy to help. Uh, and then uh, there's another uh, question here. Uh, do you have, uh, for, for the doctor, do you have any book, website, or other resources you, you like to use personally and recommend to your patients? I do, I do. So my website is thehealthyheartdoc.org. Um, I am revising an e-book downloadable, but we're happy to send you over what I do have. And if you go onto that site, we can definitely um, email that over to you. Um, so you're able to receive that. But I try and walk folks through just a simple transition. I kind of call it entry because recognizing, I'm gonna tell you all, right? We're all on this journey of thing, this thing called life. And we're all at different places on this position road. And so I tell people all the time, if I tell everyone, let's run a, ma a marathon tomorrow, 26.2 miles, we're not all going to be able to run 26.2 miles. Now there's some of us who are going to be able to run 10 miles off the bat. There's some who are going to be able to run hundred feet. But what's important is about meeting people where they're at and helping them to move, keeping their eyes on the goal, which is 26.2 miles. And so that's what my intent is. That's what my perspective is along this course. And, I, and lastly, I'll say, and Terry, not to contradict you, but what I tell people all the time is this. How many of you, and this is for those of you out there, you don't have to answer, but how many of you drink coffee? Usually when I, I say that, most pay, hands go up. And then I say, well, how many of you uh, drink alcohol? Whatever it is, ever at all, right? Now, how many of you love the taste of coffee the very first time you tasted it? Very rarely do I have any hands go up. How many of you love the taste of alcohol the first time you tasted it? I usually don't have very many hands that go up. And I say, why? But you kept at it. Why is that? Because you liked the way it made you feel. The coffee gave you energy. The alcohol relaxed you just enough for you to enjoy the moment of where you're in. And what I wanna let you know is that the same thing goes with the food. Your palate will shift, it will change, it will transform and you will love the way it makes you feel. And that's why we're doing this, to feel better, live a healthier life sp health span. That's the goal, a longer health span. None of us know the, end from, the beginning from the end, our lifespan, but we know we can. This investment in our health is equally as important as the investment in our retirement wealth. That is outstanding advice, Doctor. Outstanding. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something I can, there are a few people I can uh, mention that to 
that I can think of right, right off the top of my head. And, uh, and I know what you mean. I certainly didn't like the taste of a beer the first time I had one or coffee. Well, th thank you. Uh, I think well, I think on that one, which uh, was excellent, uh, we'll, we'll end it here. I just want to remind everybody uh, our next meeting will be Thursday, October 8th, and we'll have Dr. Michael Clapper speaking to us. Um, if you'd like to receive notice of upcoming events that are not currently, and you're not currently on our list, you can register at our website, pbnow.org. Once again, thank, thank you, Dr. Liberman. Thank you, Amberly, And thank you, Dr. Batiste. I hope everybody uh, stays safe, happy, and healthy. And good night, everybody. All right.